Hey guys. This is my first time using like a like a professional microphone because usually I'm always having dresses and can't clip anything to myself. And it's also my first time using a clicker. So you get to see the entire person of me instead of me being like, and so this slide does this and this does this. Um, so my topic tonight is lettering is not fonts, but I'm going to cover a lot of stuff because I feel like most of the time when people want to see what it, like come and hear me talk, they just want to hear me like rant about a lot of things and talk about how I got to do what I do since what I do is really specific. So um, I will start with my general new description of myself. Letter, illustrator, crazy cat lady, and secret web designer. Um, most of what Alicia was talking about, my side projects, are all web-based projects. Um, but no one knows that I'm a web designer except for people that have seen me speak in public because I will never ever do it for clients because I deal with like the most nitpicky crazy people when it comes to lettering and I could not imagine what it's like to do web design and have to like iterate over and over and over again. Um, but to give you an idea of some of my side projects if you're not familiar with them, uh, Daily Drop Cap was my first big side project and that's kind of why most people know who I am at all. Um, I worked for Louise Feely for a while who's amazing and I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with her work if not for shame. Um, but I started the project when I left working for her because I wanted something to kind of keep me motivated every day and to, um, you know, have order in, a, in an orderless life. Like I went from being in an office from 9 to 6 to like not showering until 5 p.m. and having mac and cheese for breakfast and, you know. <laughs> so I wanted something that like no matter what, every day I had to do something. It was almost like a job except it was like a project. So it went on for a little, I think it was almost a year and a half actually, because I, I had the original intention of just doing 12 alphabets, which if you do the math should be a year or under, but I did a lot of traveling and of course some client work in the interim time. Uh, so it ended up kind of extending a little bit um, beyond the original deadline. So this is all of the letters for the project. And it was kind of an amazing project for me because I am terribly impatient. I can't do long-term projects at all, so this was like a major like train for a marathon for me. But in the end, it was almost like I learned more. If I'm ever going to write a novel, I have to think of it paragraph by paragraph instead of thinking of it as I'm going to sit down and write a novel. And that's how the project kind of was for me. I, I knew that every letter would take me somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes every day. Um, towards the end of the project, it did take longer because it was like, how do I draw a W for the 11th time? Um, but it ended up being such a wonderful project for a lot of reasons. For one thing, um, it really let people know who I was. I mean, I think that that's the benefit that self-authored projects can really do. Um, of course, it's amazing whenever you can get really good stuff approved by clients. But for the most part, there's so many people that are doing what you do and are probably as good or better than you. So any way to like kind of show your personality to people and, and prove like, hey, I really actually do love to do this and I'm not just doing it because I want to get paid. Uh, Self-authored projects are really good for that. And also it became this kind of like lookbook of all the styles that I could work within. And I know like as a graphic designer, you don't want to think about having like a you know, 200 piece portfolio because it just seems like you don't know what you're doing or like you're like, you're like, oh, I don't know, whatever, just toss it all up online and hope that something sticks. But with lettering and illustration, it's kind of the opposite where having a huge portfolio is really a benefit because you end up dealing with a lot of art directors that deal with a lot of clients and the clients are like, I, I use this as an example uh, all the time, but like say you illustrated like a 250 page book for like an arboretum or something. And you probably did like a thousand drawings of trees, like every tree imaginable. And you have this in your portfolio. There's going to be some art director trying to hire you for a Christmas campaign. And if you've never drawn a tree with lights on it, they're going to be like, I just don't know if they can draw a Christmas tree. You know, so having a really, really intense portfolio as a letter and illustrator is really helpful just because it does instill a lot of confidence. And also, you, I'm sure that you guys deal all the time with people that try and give you art direction by being like, make the swirly thing slightly less swirly and move it over a hair. And you're like, I don't know what that means. Doodle on my thing for me. You know, and having like concrete examples for people to point to and be like, I like that, I don't like that, that's too crazy, that seems like it's from the 80s, and you're like, it's from the 1800s, awesome. Um, but anything to, <laughs> to kind of make people understand what you're doing is always helpful. Um, another side project, as that Alicia mentioned, was mom, this is how Twitter works. I actually did make this for my mom. Um, I had had this like feminist blog writer write me and be like, do you think it's appropriate to, you know, like continue the stereotype that moms are, you know, uh, <laughs> terrible with technology? And I'm like, no, literally, I made it for my mom. 
she had an iPad before I did. It's awesome. And uh, so it's just like a one-page site to explain like the nuances of Twitter. I haven't updated it since I first did it, and they probably have added all these crazy new features on Twitter that I should probably reference. But it's not meant to be a complete total guide and more as like a little short reference. The should I work for free flowchart, which many of you might be familiar with, this made its way over the internet like crazy. I think in the first month it had like three quarters of a million uniques and it's definitely over like maybe three or four million now. It's a one page site. I had just made like a JPEG and put it online and then all these like nerds were complaining to me about how it took too long to load. I was like, it's a 200 or 2200 pixel wide image. Of course it takes a while to load. But instead of just like letting that be, I decided to code the whole thing in HTML and CSS instead, uh, which was kind of a nine hour tedium exercise. Uh, but now because of that, I use the Google Translate and you can translate it to any language, which is really fun. And this one page site still gets like 40 or 50,000 visitors a month just because like people just pass it around every now and then it'll it'll make its way into a community like photographers love it they love the crap out of it and like so every now and then it just it just does it and I, I sell a letterpress print of it too on my site for way cheaper than it should be because it's a five color letterpress but it's a chart so no one's gonna pay a lot of money for it um, Inker Linker is a recent one that I set up which is an online database of printers to find printers based on what technology they use um, whether they're letterpress or offset, you can search by really specific stuff like whether they do flocking. And you can organize stuff by how many likes they have. Um, you can look at the comments. And I thought it was like there's probably a fair amount of resources out there to find printers, but not a lot that are like targeted specifically at the design community to kind of like talk about printers that they love and be able to promote other printers. So um, I'm doing kind of like a weekly feature now. So if any of you guys have a printer that you t are obsessed with and they've done tons of work for you and you want to have them featured, just let me know and they can be featured. Um, Don't Fear the Internet is another side project which I do with my um, fiance now. Um, I kind of forced him to do this project with me, <laughs> which is always good. But I, I, since I did teach a lot, a lot of this kind of HTML and CSS stuff and all this, all the sites that I build are in WordPress and mostly they're you know super quick sites. I set up a site last week called 52by52.org, which is a a site to help people uh, donate to charity. So you essentially pledge to donate every week to charity. I don't handle, it's nothing except a megaphone for charities. I don't do any, like everyone's like, how are you gonna handle payments? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna be like another third party that takes you away from actually donating to the charity. Um, but I, because I learned this stuff, I was able to set that site up in four hours, which is like a fully responsive just HTML site with Google Forms and stuff like that. So I really felt like there weren't a lot of designers that were able to like look at doing web design for their side projects. You know, it seemed like I have to be a web designer and that's a career and I have to focus all my time on it. Uh, and I wanted there to be the kind of in between where you can still do stuff for yourself. You're not trying to do it professionally so you don't have to read every book and every blog and go to every conference. But you, it's enough so that you can kind of get off your developer friends backs and make them like not change like the border on an image at three o'clock in the morning. So that's what kind of what it's for. Um, so I didn't always know that I wanted to get into doing what I did, of course, like everybody. I went to art school at Tyler School of Art. Um, I always knew I wanted to do art, but I didn't know what graphic design was. And like I say that in the most literal way possible. Like I literally did not even think about the fact that people make pretty commercial things until I was in college. So I went to school. Um, the way that my school's format is you do a foundation year and then Sophomore year, you do a bunch of like experimental kind of um, you know side classes, and then do, you declare at the end of your sophomore year. And I fell in love with design in school, mostly because I felt like I had no opinion to express. So being like a fine artist, I was like, I'm 18. My, my upbringing has been relatively charmed. Do I want to make like expressionistic paintings about the fact that like I hated the soccer team when I was in seventh grade? Like, no. So it was so nice to be able to express other people's opinions instead of my own and was really freeing and made the process like so much more kind of fun and problem solving. Like it just felt like a profession of crossword puzzle solving or something. And so this was my thesis project. Um, it's a little dark, I'll warn you. Uh, so I made a board game about divorce called Pack Your Baggage. Um, it works exactly like the game of life, except instead of choosing between career and college, you choose between mom and dad. And uh, yeah, I know. wait, there's going to be a lot of that, so just pre be prepared. That's not even the worst of it. 
And uh, so it started, it worked chronologically from about age 12. So it was like age 12 to age 18 or 19. And so like at the beginning, you split, you choose a house, very much like the game of life. Um, you know, when you play life, you're thrown into like a career and you just have to deal with it, whatever, you pick the card. So with this game, you would pick um, these parent cards and there were probably 10 different parent personalities <laughs> that you would have. And that, this is where the gameplay kind of happened because like when you were like 12, being in like very religious household was probably okay. But when you were like getting knocked up after prom, maybe like alcoholic dad is like where you want to be because like slightly less trouble at that point. <laughs> So the whole point of the game was to collect the least amount of emotional baggage. That's why it's called Pack Your Baggage. And uh, so you would, you would get baggage by being caught doing something like fucking your teacher or like cheating on a test or smoking weed behind the gym, you know. And then, uh, but the good thing was if you caught your parents doing something like fucking a teacher or, you know, you would, you would be able to collect guilt money and every $200 in guilt money could be used to pay for therapy to take away baggage. So um, the way that the board works, so wherever the, um, the paths cross over themselves, this is like a major life moment for your parent, which means that their personality could change at any point. Like maybe very religious mom just becomes a complete atheist or like alcoholic dad suddenly like becomes really religious. Um, but any, and so that would be like a, a thing that happened. And then any time that the paths crossed over each other, um, that would be a big life moment for you, like a major birthday or prom or something. And you could then choose to switch households if you wanted to, at a penalty, of course, because if anybody's from a divorced home, you can't just switch households without a major emotional penalty. <laughs> and if you can't tell, the, it makes a giant middle finger here, right when you're about to leave home. <laughs> and so, like, the whole goal is to, like, move out of your parents' house and end up in the best position possible. So the, like the like fancy loft is at the top and then like mom's basement is at the bottom. <laughs> and then you would get these two blame it on divorce cards which you would save for something really good because if anybody is from a divorced home you know that you have like one or two chances to use that. Like hey, if only you guys were together and they're like I don't believe you anymore. You used that last month. <laughs> and then the game pieces themselves were children dealing with the divorce through various neuroses. So <laughs> there's a cutter and a boy dressed as a girl and an overeater and a bedwetter. Yeah, so my teachers were like, were like you're OK, right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, it's not as autobiographical as you think, I swear. Like, my parents are divorced, but it's sort of OK now. <laughs> so that was my thesis project. And that was one of the first projects that I did that had a lot of lettering in it. I didn't understand that lettering was like a whole separate industry when I was in school. I just thought that it was like, it's what you do when you're too broke to buy fonts, you know? So I, I started loving it because I noticed that the more I did it, the more my projects kind of stood out from my peers. Like everything just looked so finished, like really, really quickly in the process. It wasn't like at the end when you're doing those final tweaks and you're like, oh, finally it looks done. Like I was f kind of molding everything from the beginning. So it always felt like, like it had a voice from the beginning of the project. And so that's why I loved to be able to do the like, lettering and illustration. I was really happy that I ended up in a school that wasn't like super duper Swiss, that was like, oh, that's not practical. You can't, you know, make art out of metal in design school. Like my school was totally like, yeah, whatever, you're in school. When can you ever do like, in, like a die cut this crazy complex? Everyone's just going to shit on you after school once you try and do this. <laughs> so, so I got to do kind of whatever I wanted. And because of that, like I, I approached design with like a, a much more imaginative standpoint and also like a, like a much more entrepreneurial, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna make this because I need it, rather than, oh, I, I guess I can't use illustration, I guess I can't use photography, I guess you can't use this. It always just became like, and this is why like, I loved working for Louise and why I think Louise liked me working for her, is that she could just come to my desk and be like, can you do this? And I'd be like, yeah, probably, we'll figure it out. Like something can be done of that. And I think that that, that really helped me in my career and kind of figuring out what I liked and what I didn't like as well. So when I graduated, I worked for Headcase Design in Philly, which was a little tiny studio. I've only worked for tiny studios. I've never worked for a big corporation, though I do plenty of work for big corporations now. Um, but it was a wonderful little place to work, probably one of the mo most creative places in Philadelphia. And they did half illustration and half book design. So I got to work on some really awesome titles, like, like I got to have Uncle Junior from The Sopranos put his glasses on my face when, I went, when we went to go on set to like art direct stuff for The Sopranos book which is awesome and I don't have pictures of it and that sucks. Um, but 
we, I also got to do a lot of illustration while I was there, and, and that's where I really kind of like found this love of illustration, and also found a love for the process of illustration, because it's so different from design, even though they're related industries, because like as designers, you're always working directly with clients, like for the most part, unless you work for someone else that's a, you know, a creative director or something. So almost always the art direction that you're getting is from someone that does not know what they're talking about. Or like they might know exactly what they want or sort of know what they're talking about, but it's still like you have to relearn it every time and you have to reteach it every time. You have to explain what your process is, what the design process is, like what, what it's like to buy a font. Like they, you're like, no, I can't just give it to you. You have to buy it, you know? <laughs> and that's like something that just happens all the time. But with illustration, you're dealing mostly with art directors and creative directors and people that are used to dealing with creatives. So a lot of times, the process can be so much smoother because you don't have to prove to your, like the, your client that you're worth hiring. You know, they came to you for your specialized skill. So a lot of times, it's, it requires a lot less hand-holding. And also, the schedules are a bit easier just because if you're, you're one step removed from the end product. So when you deal with a client that is straight hiring you to do design work, they're just going to run you into the ground until they feel it's right. So like there might be like a two month like deadline, but at the same time, if they're willing to pay you extra for your time, that project might go on for a year. And with, with illustration, usually it's like the magazine has to print. I guess it's done now. You know, <laughs> there is like a definite moment in which the artwork has to be done. And so because of that, that's why illustrators' portfolios tend to be a lot more robust than designers' portfolios because the project deadlines are much quicker, there's quicker turnaround, and also the process can be a lot smoother. So when I, like, when I got Young Guns and the print magazine thing, a lot of people were like, why do you, why, how do you have such a big portfolio? And I'm like, because I'm an illustrator, not a designer anymore. You know, I, can, I have a client folder that's like 250 deep. They're all like little clients, but you know, it's not like I get these return clients a lot. And most of the time when it's return clients, it might not even be the same art director. Um, but this was something that I did when I was working for Headcase because I wanted to get more freelance illustration work. So I put together this series of um, the 12 Days of Christmas, and they were, I was like so broke in Philly. You know when you graduate school and you're eating like off-brand ramen and like you're, you're biking around because like the $2 on the subway is still not something that you want to pay for? And uh, so I put together this promo and invested like almost two grand in printing it and you know, had a bunch of friends come over and assemble everything and I sent it out to 250 art directors and then um, like five people who I thought were really awesome including Christoph Neiman and Nicholas Bleckman and Louise Feely and I heard back from no one except from Louise Feely. So she had me come in and do an interview and I had no idea she was hiring. I thought she just wanted to see what like the youth of today were doing. So I showed up, I was like bede bedecked in this like black trash bag because it was raining and I like didn't have a coat and had to carry like a hundred pound portfolio. So I was like, I can't do an umbrella and the hundred pound portfolio at the same time. So I was just a mess and showed up at her, at her office, but she offered me a job that day and it was like totally crazy. I was working at Headcase, I was teaching part time. I had like a really close friend network in Philadelphia and was starting to get this kind of freelance illustration ball rolling. But of course, it's not something that you can turn down when this like legend of design asks you to come work for them. So, and it ended up being like the best decision ever um, because I think when I was working for Louise is when I really, really found what, what I wanted to do for a living, which was, you know, to focus on lettering and type. So um, Louise has a teeny tiny studio, if you're not uh, aware. Um, she has two employees plus herself. And she is like an old school art director. She is not a computer person. She does InDesign for like invoicing people and stuff. But for, I mean, for the most part, it's just sketch. Like she, gives, she does sketches, she gives them to you, she art directs you. So any, anything that you see that comes out of her office is like coming directly from her brain through someone else's hands. And it's just, she had that kind of awesome old school um, upbringing in the New York design community. She worked for Herb Lou Allen, who's of course like a crazy legend. And, and you know has just been doing it for like she's had her studio for 25 years or something now so it was so awesome to work for her mostly because I got to kind of see it almost felt like I was in a way like also working for her Blue Ballon and working for all these other you know old school art directors um, but she just ran her studio so tightly and like Headcase was a wonderful experience too but at the same time it felt like 
everything was a bit more manic there. Like it was, there was a time management problem. So there would be, oh my God, we have to work until three o'clock in the morning on this book because <laughs> all of a sudden it's due tomorrow. And with Louise, it was like, I never worked after 6 p.m. the whole two and a half years that I was working there. So I worked from nine to 6 p.m. every day. And that's essentially like how I could manage all the freelance work as well. Because if, if you've ever tried to do freelance while having a day job, it's like crazy. A little easier as with illustration because clients don't expect to like meet with you. They just expect everything happens through email. But because her office was just run so tightly, I got to you know really develop two separate lives um, during that same time period. So I did a lot of logo work, of course. She does a ton of stuff for the food industry, a lot of food packaging, a lot of restaurant logos, um, and just so much work. And I got to draw letters every day, essentially. So when I first started working there for like the first six months, I was brought in as kind of the junior design position, which is much more of like a managing old clients and updating stuff than it is creating new work. But um, she would have me kind of face off with the senior designer to the chagrin of the senior designer because oftentimes my, my pieces would end up being the, the ones that the clients favored. And then over, over time, I kind of advanced into that senior position. Um, so at first, she would give me these incredibly tight sketches, bring in these like perfect things of vintage type into the office and I would essentially just have to like trace them. Um, but as our relationship kind of grew and as, as our working relationship got better and better, she could just like tell me what she wanted or do really loose doodles and I would know exactly what she meant and just be able to make stuff. And then in the extra time, after I did the thing that she asked for, I'd be able to iterate whatever I wanted to too, like if I had an idea for a client. So in the end, like I spent all day looking at awesome vintage type because her and Steve have like a separate apartment full of books she would, she, it's crazy, it's in the same building uh, that they live in. So he has a whole separate apartment as his library. And she would come in and be like, oh, I found this album full of thousands of tiny embossed stickers at like a flea market in France. And it was 15 euro like 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh, I hate you and want that. <laughs> and <laughs> so like most people, I, like when I get asked all the time where I draw my inspiration from, like most people want to know like what modern books am I looking at? Like what resources can I give them? And a lot of my kind of style inspiration is still just coming from looking at this stuff for years. And also from coming to a new understanding about lettering and type, which is that I, like, if you know the components that make it up well enough, like if, you, if you're familiar with like what serifs happened in what time and when little spurs were appropriate, when a soft S happened, you know, then you can kind of approach a project from the building blocks up instead of taking a reference and translating it. So in the end, you end up kind of making more original work that way if you're more familiar with the components rather than trying to mimic something that already existed. Um, and also one thing that I really learned, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over time like hardcore here, I'm being real talky. Uh, <laughs> but another thing that I learned uh, while working for it, which was really important, was when lettering was appropriate and when type was appropriate. So one of the, one of the big parts of the talk tonight is kind of to go over the difference because people use all the terms interchangeably, um, but they mean very specific things. So for this, it was just a one-off wine label for a Prosecco. The client just needed a label, that's it. So lettering could be all over it, like it, it could be all custom. So the only thing that's not custom on this actually is this type here, and it's just like Engraver's Gothic, which I use on everything, and it's like, I should stop. But, um, but for this client, um, which was a, I think it was, it might have been a different client, they, they wanted to do like 15 different wines and wouldn't be able to hire Louise for every single wine to letter a new title because it would be like $1,000 or $1,500 label just to letter like a single line of type. So what we did was um, lettered, I'm going to move my microphone up because I feel like I've been nice and loud that way. Um, we lettered this part here and then chose typefaces to match so then they could extend the brand without having to you know, hire Louise every single wine label. So that's something that I kind of realized. And, and now, too, it's, it makes it easier for me to delegate when I get a new job. So a lot of people try and hire me for things that I'm not good at. Or they, or they try and hire me for something that I know that another person would be better at. So for instance, someone tried to hire me to do um, editorial work, but it was like six headlines on one page. And they essentially were, were paying like it was only one headline on one page. And they needed it like immediately, like within two days. And I was like, you need to hire a calligrapher. A calligrapher can bang this out. And they were like, but that's what you do for a living. You're a calligrapher. And I'm like, nope, that's not what I do for a living. So, and having to like explain that and understand the nuances between everything is, is really interesting. And that's why I'm happy that I get to talk a lot to crowds because I feel like the more people are educated, the easier it is to kind of get everybody work. <laughs> 
but I, got, I did a lot of book covers while I was there too. And um, so this was a book cover that I did that I actually sat at my desk and embroidered myself and while eating pastries and listening to Moroccan music. So when I was thinking about leaving, working for Louise, I had to like think about this cover and be like, oh my God, I could never have a real job again. <laughs> because like who would ever have a job where they would be able to do this? And like she would occasionally make us lunch and like, you know, give us birthday presents and stuff like that. I'm like, no employer does that. And so I told Louise when I was thinking about leaving um, that I, I would only ever work for her for myself from here on out. And I think I, think I could probably hold true to that. <laughs> but um, another thing that I did a lot when I was working for her was when we had any extra time, I would try and extend the lettering that I did into full alphabets just because, you know, instead of filling my time with like looking at lolcats online, um, which is probably not something that she would be as pleased about, even though I did plenty of that while working for her, because if you ever have a day job, you do that. You just can't avoid it. Um, I would always try, whenever I had an extra moment, to kind of extend these alphabets. And it was a great exercise, for one thing, because, like, lettering is not something that you can be good at quickly. You know, there's just so much nuance to it. There's so much to learn that, like, you just have to iterate and iterate and iterate before you can even see what you're doing. I went to a talk by Christian Schwartz, who's an amazing um, font designer, type designer. And um, he, sh he was showing this. They did like a, a updated Helvetica version, because every type designer alive has done that at one point or another. But he showed these two A's next to each other and was like, could you believe how different they are? And I was like, that is the same. It's the same letter, <laughs> you know? And, but then, the, then he showed two blocks of type. And it's like, oh my god, that is so different. Because when you see it in context, you know, you see just how much personality you can inflect by just moving points over a couple, uh, like a millimeter. And this was something that I kind of learned with, with the lettering stuff is that like no matter how naturally gifted you are, it still requires so much practice to do. You can't take a weekend workshop in lettering and feel like you know what you're doing. And I think that's why I just refuse to do workshops because I think everybody should do like calligraphy workshops because that's like a practical skill and like it influences your lettering so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not something that you can learn quickly. There's no shortcut in Illustrator to make your curves fast and good. Like even I draw funky curves all the time and I'm like, ugh, like a day later. Um, but it's just, you just have to refine both your eye and your hand simultaneously. So, and this is the last uh, Louise piece I'll show. I love showing this piece because I know that like young designers and everybody now essentially because everybody's like having employment problems, you get told all the time that you need to do everything, that you need to like, be an amazing print designer and be able to draw lettering and also be a motion person and also code HTML and also do all this stuff. And the guy that drew the chocolate on this only draws chocolate for a living. <laughs> so, and he uses like Photoshop 5 too because he like thinks it works the best. So, so every, anytime that I always hear like a young designer being like, oh, like, I really, like, I, I need to learn motion even though I hate it. And I'm like, no, you don't. That guy only draws chocolate. Just figure out, figure out your chocolate, you know? <laughs> you could do it. Uh, so you could still specialize is, like, a big thing that, that I love to kind of talk about because most people don't, they, they love specializers. They love to, like, hear about people that specialize but don't believe that they can do it themselves. And the biggest thing is just the time commitment. I'm sure that a lot of you have read Malcolm Gladwell books because that's, like, everybody in the universe has ever read his books. But that 10,000 hours thing, you know, I'm going to say like a lot of people kind of are like, oh, Malcolm Gladwell, you got to take it with a grain of salt. I totally do believe that. And, and I see it more optimistic than pessimistic. A lot of people look at that 10,000 hours thing. If you're not familiar, if you do 10,000 hours in something, you be, you're an expert or can become an expert. Um, a lot of people look at it pessimistically as like, how can I put in that time? But I look at it optimistically and say, you know, as long as you can put the time in, no matter how much time it takes, you can master something. So I think that you just have to, it's, it's really difficult to figure out what that is that you want to devote your time to. But if you can kind of organically find that out, you can become a, an expert in something. And I think that that's kind of how the industry is kind of working now and how I hope that it moves and that people stop, you know, thinking that they need to do everything and, and can appreciate the specialties. Because if you appreciate the specialties, you know how to send work around when someone else will be faster at it. And you know then that other people will send work to you when they know that you'll be better at it. So I always am happy to send work along to other people and definitely do not try to keep it all for myself. Um, so I was working on illustration at the same time. If you guys ever want to be successful illustrators, dogs doing human things, winner all the time. <laughs>
Honestly, if you're ever working with a crazy art director and they're just like, I don't know, I just don't understand what this concept's about, even though it's like plain as day, you're just like, do whatever that concept is, but with a dog doing it. <laughs> It'll get approved like right away. Um, but this was actually for like a, a dog-related article. So uh, this is for Wired Magazine. Wired Magazine, like one thing that's awesome about being an illustrator is that you get to be that like crazy weird uncle in your family that knows way too much about way too much. Like you know the one that's like, did you know that teeth originate as tooth buds in the back of your head and slowly migrate to your mouth? I'm like, why would anyone want to know that? You know, <laughs> but you become that person because you read some article in like Harvard Business Review about some random thing. So. This was about a, uh, a fancy dog hotel in San Francisco. Uh, this was like one of my dream projects where Entertainment Weekly called me and said, we have this article about famous internet cats. Here's a bunch of YouTube videos. Make sure you watch them. And I was like, I haven't seen any of these before. And, but really, of course, I had like a billion times. And uh, if you guys haven't seen this video, anyone in the crowd that knows that one is like, yeah, of course, everyone needs to see that video. Search Maru paper bag and your life will be changed forever. Um, this was another one for Wired about a Jedi training class in lower Manhattan. <laughs> these dudes spend like 300 bucks on like these crazy glass lightsabers that battle with each other. It's like for real. And uh, my family used to watch Star Wars all the time when I was growing up on Thanksgiving, weirdly. Like it kind of replaced the Wizard of Oz thing somehow. Um, but I hadn't watched in a few years, so I went to the video store and rented two of the Star Wars, and then Predator, just because I really like watch, pre watch Predator. <laughs> and I went out to check out, and the video store guy was like, what is your name? <laughs> <laughs> and then from that point out, I like couldn't rent any of like the shitty girl movies that I really wanted to watch, because like I watched just the most terrible movies ever all the time. Um, but also, surround yourself with nerds. So I, I sent this final artwork to the client, and then one of my friends came down to my studio and was like asking me what I was working on. I showed it to him. And he was like, oh my god, you can't put a purple lightsaber in there. That's like part of the new movies. All the, nerd, all the originals, like they don't use purple lightsabers. And I'm like, now I've got to resend the file because my nerd friend spotted something. <laughs> so this is the non-purple lightsaber version. But more and more, I started trying to incorporate lettering into my illustration work. I still didn't know at this point that lettering was like a separate industry. I was just like, oh, yeah, I like drawing letters. It's fun. Um, so and you, it's, it's awesome to do for illustration because you get away with so much. Like you can just make stuff up in, in editorial stuff. And they, I feel like they don't even read it. Um, but like this says like brewski, brain slower downer. Like just making up titles for stuff that's in the, in the illustration. This actually said OMFG, and they made me get rid of the F. So they do read something. But, um, <laughs> So this was for an article about the teenage brain. If you didn't know this when you're 18, your brain is only 80% developed. Now you know. Now you become the weird uncle. <laughs> um, but I started proposing these solutions that were half illustration. Like one would be an illustration, and one would be lettering, and just to kind of see which one they would choose. So um, this was for an article about badmovies.org, which is an online B horror movie compendium. Um, it, ha it has these nice quizzes that let you know whether or not it's a B-horror movie, like, is the cover lenticular printed? Are there more than one pro wrestler in it? <laughs> so I, I gave these two, these two uh, options, which were essentially the same concepts, just in two, approached two different ways. So I just wanted to make like a big mashup of all the categories. So this is maybe like the favorite thing that I've ever drawn in my whole life. And I wish I still had the original sketch because I would frame it and like put it in my bathroom or something. Um, but it's like a Vargas girl with a creature from the Black Lagoon head, some grenades thrown in there for good measure. And this is just like the, the typographic solution to the same problem. So I wanted to make up a title that was like the biggest mashup of all the categories. And that's the one that they went for. So Unstoppable Kung Fu Zombie Teenage Bikini Creatures from the Planet Death became a reality. And so the title of this file is like that plus AI at the end. So whenever someone actually uh, archives my files, they're going to be real, ha ha, you're so funny. <laughs> um, so letter, like I, I was getting hired more and more to do things because of lettering. And so this is like a major thing that's really simple but really difficult to realize as a designer or as an illustrator. Put things in your portfolio that you actually want to do for a living. Because no matter, like you might be awesome at drawing maps but like hate the process to like the thousandth degree, but have a portfolio full of maps because everyone wants to hire people to draw maps. And so like if you don't want to draw maps for a living, don't put maps in your portfolio. If you don't want to do like like weirdo corporate work, like try to put some other work in there. Like the corporate work kind of has to happen, you know, to pay the bills. But try and put enough work in there that kind of 
leans your portfolio in a way that you want it to go. Um, so I was doing more and more lettering, and, and then people started seeing that and hiring me more and more for lettering projects. And it started with this like, very illustrative lettering stuff. So this was for the Wall Street Journal. And just to give you the idea of like, how a letterer thinks versus how like, a type designer or, or a regular designer might think, I drew this in perspective. Not, I didn't draw it and then skew it. I drew like, the whole grid thing in perspective. Because letterers are crazy, and they can't think with it not being the final. Like, so when you do lettering, you don't expect for it to be repurposed. It's essentially just an image that is made of words. So, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand when they think about letterers. They think, oh, well, you, have, you made a typeface of that and then made the image. And it's like, nope, I drew one word, and that's it. That's all it'll ever be. Do you plan on making a font? Nope, I don't plan on making a font. I plan on doing other work, maybe making a font of something else. So that's like a big difference that not a lot of people realize between lettering and type design. Um, I did some stuff for the Boston Globe, and again, it was like super illustrative, but at the same time, very focused on, on the lettering and on the type. And this was essentially like my daily drop cap project before daily drop cap happened. So this was the thing that all my clients referenced when they called me. I would just over and over again get this same series referenced. So the Boston Globe hired me to do um, a series of six il illustrations, typographic illustrations, that would run on six consecutive days that were all the same phrase. So why we love Boston in winter, and they were all meant to illustrate kind of different things that the magazine was going to feature. So there was one for like outdoor stuff. There was one about you know meeting your neighbors. There was one about you know being out and about on the town. Um, but this one is really the one that started a bit of a meme in my portfolio, um, which is ribbon type. So I became the ribbon type girl for quite a while. Um, so. For like two or three years, I did just so much ribbon type. <laughs> and it was hard to like have the enthusiasm when the jobs came in because, you know, like we get so jaded so quick and we need to just step back and be like, I'm not mopping up blood at the hospital. I love what I do, you know? <laughs> but so many times, like, like you end up like to be like, oh my God, ribbon type again, you know? So I would get these clients to call me and I would be like, oh, that's a really unique concepts, you know, and, and do it and whatever, and you shouldn't bitch about stuff that pays your bills, but um, I'm happy that there's slightly less ribbon type happening now. Um, but this was the most recent ribbon type thing that happened, which I was really stoked about. So um, this actually isn't even that recent. I did this when I was working for Louise. So Louise saw all the ribbon type that I was doing, and when we did these proposals for the love stamp, she was like, you know, what do you, like, what do you think we're going to do for it, blah, blah, blah. And we were kind of going back and forth. And I was like, well, you know, why don't we do something with the ribbon type since I've been doing so much of that. And so it became one of the options. And it was the, op the first option that they chose to print. So finally, three years later, um, it's actually getting produced. So in 20, early 2012, this should be out. So really big deal. Also, I'm getting married in 2012. So I get to use my real stamp on my invitations. No zazzle here. <laughs> Pretty stoked about it. Also, this is one of those things that your parents like will freak out about until Kingdom Come. So, my mom thinks this is like the best thing ever, and all she does is like talk to the post office worker like in her town about how I'm gonna do this, and they're like, yeah, whatever, blah blah blah. And then finally, they're like, oh wow, you know, <laughs> that's cool. We actually saved a post office by accident, which is awesome. So, um, I hired my mom when she got laid off from her job to do all of my order fulfillment. Um, so she's kind of like my, if you email me ever, my mom reads your email, just so you know. And she's cool though, so you could make dick jokes and it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> because I ended up, I was, I was shipping all my stuff to FedEx in, in New York, and she doesn't have a FedEx like within 40 miles of her house. So now we ship everything USPS, and she has this little two-man post office in her hometown. And because of all this new like work now that she's shipping out from there, they got taken off the shutdown list. So, <laughs> doing, yeah, <laughs> that makes me feel good for like spending too much money on a credenza or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so more and more, I was getting hired to do just straight lettering stuff, which was really fun and weird because I, I always thought about the lettering that was more just like looked like fonts that it was fonts. I was like, there's like a billion fonts in the world. They're probably just finding a cool font. And you'll see this all the time too, like on the type of file forums. People will show examples of lettering and be like, what font is this? And then somebody has to chime in, it's lettering. It's not a font, it doesn't exist. Uh, but Tiffany hired me to do a Valentine's campaign for them a few years ago. And it was really fun because you want to talk about a project that's going to make your stepmom like lose her mind, is do stuff for Tiffany and company. 
So, I mean, they were kind of like, how come your picture's not on the website, you know, as you guys deal with all the time? Like, <laughs> how come your, your picture isn't next to the author in the back of the book cover? And it's like, because I'm not the author. Um, but I got so amped about this. They hired me to do this, uh, you know, test for them. And it was like in July or something for, for Valentine's Day. And I got so stoked that I made a whole alphabet because they were going to hire me to do 15 different headlines. And I wanted to be prepared for when it came in. Uh, so I did this full alphabet. I was ready to roll. I'm like, yeah, this job's going to come in. And then they ended up just having me put swashes on their font. <laughs> so I was like super like, oh, no, like the Arrested Development Peanuts song thing that happens. <laughs> um, I was kind of feeling like that. But then it, like each of them took like 15 or 20 minutes to do, and it paid my rent for like four months. So I was like, I really should not bitch about this. So um, it ended up being really fun. And, and you know, having your stuff be on something that's that kind of high profile was like, mind-blowing especially as like a young designer because you're, you're just shocked that people pay you to do anything that when you get something that's like really high profile it's really amazing um, but on top of doing stuff for like really classy clients like Tiffany and company I have the pleasure of occasionally doing uh, lettering for romance novel covers so uh, when they first started coming in my rep I have a I have a rep that handles like all my business crap I've, I've been with him since I since I graduated so at first he helped me to get a lot of the work and then over time, because I'm like an internet crazy person and always like being like, look at me, look at me, I started getting more work just because of that. But he still handles all my contracts, he still does all my invoicing, and um, he helps me manage new projects that come in. So when this came in, he was like, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, it's like not, not really high profile. Like, well, uh, we should probably leave a hole in your schedule. I was like, oh my god, they're going to put it on a bear dude's chest. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm going to be sitting across on the train from someone and be like, ha, 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 you know. <laughs> so sure enough, like this was the lettering that I did for this title, and then this is what the final one ended up being. <laughs> so they really keep like the integrity of your work. If you can't see, so this is what I did. They replaced my, t my author type with like, like some Daniel Steele font. Um, but, and that's what the original one looked like, so they, they beefed it up and took away a lot of swashes. But whatever, I don't care. It's no big deal. And this was another one where my rep was like, I don't know if you have time for this. And I'm like, but 14-year-old girls will love me. <laughs> and uh, so People Magazine was doing this uh, feature on Twilight. And I was like, anything that I can do that's like stupid pop culture, I always do it, like no matter what it is. So this one, they, they had me. And they actually did a really wonderful job carrying. The art director did a wonderful job carrying all the work throughout the magazine. So they pulled apart all my swashes and made all these cool ornaments and did some drop caps that were, they picked a typeface that was like close-ish and it worked out really well. Um, but it was super fun. Uh, United Pixel Workers, someone's wearing a United Pixel Workers shirt today that I met earlier and I already forgot your name, sorry. Um, but this was a really fun one and I've been getting more and more involved in the, in the web world which people think is really weird because what I do for a living is like the opposite of the web world, you know. Um, I mostly most of my my stuff that I do that's c client commissioned is all for print, you know. So and but the the, the reason why I kind of got involved in the web stuff is that I wrote this like really ranty article on my website about how you should not hire me to do web design, and this is it's it's along the lines of the specialization thing. And I really believe that a lot of a lot of professions are underappreciated, and you don't under you don't understand like the work that goes into stuff, and I think that. Like like lettering, writers are just completely fucked. I'm sorry. Like yeah, but everyone's like, I know how to write. I'm you know, I, I don't need to pay someone to do it. Um, and web designers are kind of in that realm as well because there's so many tools out there to help you design for web quickly, even though it doesn't necessarily build like the most you know standard based uh, websites and whatnot. But I really wanted to write an article about how it's not smart to like hire someone like me to do like a Photoshop mock-up and then like hire some really terrible programmer to put it together and it's all just like image rollovers because it's 2011 and that should not be the case anymore. And most people don't understand that most like um, like really good sites are team efforts. You know, you get a UI person, UX person, you get the back end guy, you get the front end guy, you get the designer that also knows a little front end, you get like the illustrator that does illustrations for the site. It's very much a team effort and I think it should be because that generates jobs too. So I wrote this article, and the, and the web designers love me for it. So that's why I end up talking at web conferences quite a bit. Um, but United Pixel Workers is kind of like a really fun little uh, t-shirt effort. And they just they have people design a shirt for them, and then it's only available for a month. And then they don't reprint after that. So they essentially just print on demand, because they have people pre-buy the shirts, print them, and then that's it. So it's a limited edition thing. It's pretty cool. They get awesome designers to make stuff. Not myself. I'm just OK. <laughs> 
And then uh, this was, so this is some recent work. I'm, I'm nearing the end of the work, my work portion and, and, and entering the what, what we came here to talk about portion. So uh, <laughs> after like an hour of me being like blah, 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 on stage. So um, I did this stuff for Barnes & Noble, which was really amazing. They hired me. I've, I've been able to do a couple of kind of dream jobs so far in my career, which is it's another one of those things like you have to kind of step back and realize like if I was 22 and realized that I'd be doing this in a few years, I would just be like throwing up rainbows, you know. <laughs> and so Barnes & Noble hired me to do the, these uh, vintage covers and they were all these kind of, uh, they really wanted it to be really lettering based. Uh, they're all kind of classic books. I've done 12 up to this point now, but six are released now. Um, and they're super crazy because they're leather bound, double foil stamped. So there's like a metallic foil and a non-metallic foil. I did not have to put a logo on the spine, nor did I have to leave room for a barcode. So anyone that has ever worked in publishing it should be gasping right now. <laughs> but so it was like a huge deal and I loved working on them and I continue to love working on them. But they're probably the last of the book covers that I will do for a while because book covers have become a major pain in the ass to do. Um, so more and more I was getting hired to do this stuff that just essentially looked like, like font manipulation. And this can be something that is difficult for people to kind of realize is lettering. It's like when it looks like it could exist as a typeface. And there are so many places where lettering makes sense that most people don't even realize. Like if you think about, say you made a book cover and you want to use one typeface on the cover. But when you use the typeface to do the title and then the author, you know, there's going to be a major scale difference. The fins might be completely messed up at the, at the tiny, tiny, uh, size and then when when you blow it up really big it looks really horsey so that's a perfect place to hire a letterer that most people don't even think about where you have your typeface that you'd like but you need someone to redraw it to be at different sizes so that's something that like I learned um, is a major part of the lettering industry and if you wanted to break into lettering that's a good uh, place to start is to just think about typefaces that you want to use and say, you know, I need this at a display weight, but I can't hire the, the type designer to make me a display weight font because that would be way too expensive. Um, and then this is some more recent work too where um, I'm, I get hired a lot to do the kind of vintage inspired type because of my background with Louise and because it is something that, you know, not a lot of people can do well. A lot of people either are doing straight rips off of vintage stuff or, you know, it's a, a little too crazy. Um, and I think that the reason why a lot of people hire me to do what I do is that I can kind of modernize the vintage but not make it too like insano um, and like sw swashes everywhere and stuff. I don't hide behind the ornamentation, which a lot of people do. Um, if you ever want to see if someone's actually like good at lettering, like try and visualize whatever it is you're looking at without all the doohickeys all over it because if they're not focusing on the kind of like fine details and the structure of the type itself, then they're probably more interested in decoration than they are actually in lettering. And it's, it's the thing that is wonderful about lettering that, that I, the reason why I'm really happy that I fell into it as a career is because it combines my favorite parts about design with my favorite parts about illustration. So illustration can get a little monotonous sometimes just because you're hired constantly to play your greatest hits. You know, if you're gonna draw a tree, you draw a tree the same way almost all the time. You draw people a certain way, if you draw people a different way, people get upset because they expected it one way and you're not delivering it. And with design, you, you get to you know, make a project based on what the best solution would be. So a lot of times you can be a little bit more experimental. You, know, you might have a studio that is known for a certain style but they can probably convince the client to like leap outside of it a little bit. There are very few illustrators that can do this. Christoph Neiman is probably one of the only ones because when people hire him, they hire him for his brain, not for his hands. They know that whatever solution he's going to output is going to be like just the most funny, elegant, simple solution ever. Um, but the thing that is great about lettering is that I, I keep the same schedule as an illustrator. I'm working with art directors all the time. And for the most part, this, because of that, I'm, I'm working with people that Maybe if they, if they don't know everything about what I do, they at least have an appreciation and enthusiasm for what I do because they thought in the first place to hire a letterer. And um, <laughs> so a lot of people ask me like what I do for fun when I'm not doing client work or lettering stuff. And usually it's like more lettering or these like weirdo side projects that I do. So I collaborated with Friends of Type. They had me come in as a guest poster. And I made a few really fun pieces. So this was one of them because I love sriracha more than anything. I bring it to brunch with me occasionally, um, which people kind of laugh at because you show up with a big condiment bottle. 
Um, and this was my favorite one, I think, that I did for it because I really love the Museum of Natural History. <laughs> and uh, it's, the thing about the lettering community that I really love is that it's small. I mean, the design community is small. I'm sure that you guys have been to conferences before and run into the same people. Um, and imagine that like, like distilled down to like a group of a few hundred people. I mean, the people that are kind of well known for doing lettering, it's, it's not that many people. Um, and so it's really nice because everybody kind of wants to help each other out and collaborate. And because we're such crazy nerds, we understand the difference between what one person does and what another person does. So even though like, so Eric Marinovich is one of the friends of type and he and I actually have a lot of overlap in style, but we both know like when he's good to use and when I'm good to use. So if I get a job that's like for a brush script, I'm not gonna attempt to do it unless I, I'm empty of work because I know it's gonna take me so much time to do. So I'll refer them to someone that is really good at working with brush scripts. So, and that's something that like is really nice in the lettering community because everybody recognizes their skills and is able to kind of help each other out and move things along to the people that are good at it. Um, this is something I did for Entertainment Weekly. Sorry, I'm getting like really congested. Um, this is something I did for Entertainment Weekly about Harry Potter, which was awesome. Again, anything that's like pop culture related, I will totally do in a heartbeat. So if you if you want me to do like a tattoo for you, I never do tattoos for people. If you come up with like some really stupid pop culture idea, I'll probably do it, just because why not? Um, and then this was another um, kind of bigger job. So this is one of those things where like a lot of people ask if this is a typeface or where they can buy the typeface, and trying to diff like tell people that. You can make things that look like typefaces even though they're not typefaces is like a big part of lettering. And, and so I'll get into doing the, uh, I'll just get a breeze through some of these because you've seen them before. This one is, um, I actually made a typeface for it because, that I'm never going to sell or reuse just because the client hired me to do this big chunk of text and it was easier for me to make a quickie typeface that's incomplete, not all the letters of course, just so that when they had edits I could, I could type it out instead uh, and it was terribly kerned and stuff. I had to hand kern it. But it made it easier for me. So I, I end up using type design as a tool more than as a profession. So type design is just like lettering, right? Um, I thought this was true up until probably a year ago. I thought that type design and lettering were so, well, they were kissing cousins. I thought they were, it was just like the next progressive step. Um, so I made this fun buttermilk and it did really well and by the grace of God it actually works because I put it together in about three months before I took any courses in typeface design and um, you know I'm very proud of it as a first effort but at the same time like I as all of your work you look at it and go oh I told I could change that thing but too bad it's already out in the world um, but I, I really didn't understand that like type design and lettering were just totally totally different worlds so to give you a little assessment here, typography versus type design versus lettering. Lettering, obviously, you guys all know what it is now because I've been talking about it for like an hour. Um, type design is like, imagine if I am like your, your uncle that can build an awesome dollhouse for you that's like amazing and should be in a museum. Um, I can't build you a skyscraper. And type designers are like architects of skyscrapers to me for the most part, P text type designers anyway. They have to make these things that are modular, that are idiot proof, like anyone can pick it up and rearrange it and it's going to be wonderful and work. And so much of the work of type design is the post-production stuff. It's not the artistry. I mean, there's artistry in the, pr in the production. But um, I mean, most people that do typeface design will tell you that the f like a fifth of, of the work that they do on a typeface is actually drawing the letters. And the rest is working on spacing, working on doing open, open type coding and all that kind of stuff. So. It's kind of crazy. Calligraphy versus lettering. Lettering is drawing, calligraphy is writing. And that's like the, the base definition of the two. So if you, if you know anyone, like Doyle Young is an amazing, he was an amazing letterer. He wasn't a calligrapher, even though a lot of his work looked like calligraphy because he drew all of his letters. So he was a letterer. Anyone that uses like pointed pen and actually draws, that's calligraphy. And there's times when both are useful. Like you would not hire me to do the envelopes for your friend's wedding because it would take me 10 times the amount of time that it takes a practice calligrapher to do it. Typography is the art of arranging type. So you guys are all typographers in your own right for being designers. You can arrange type on a page. Type is you know, the actual design of the letters that go into the font. And then fonts are the software that you install on your computer. So a lot of people use the word font to talk about what I do. 
And um, actually, if you read like Wikipedia or Webster or anything about fonts, it, fonts used to mean like if you were a letterpress printer and wanted to buy metal type, say you wanted to buy um, Baskerville, you would buy Baskerville 14 point, Baskerville 16 point, Baskerville 18 point, and each of those would be a font, you know? And, but now because we're buying like whole suites of uh, you know, families, people consider that to be kind of the font. So, but each of, each of the subsets of it is kind of a font. It's really weird and crazy semantics. Don't worry if you fuck it up, it's okay. I'm gonna forgive you, the type, the real nerds get a little uppity about it, but don't worry about it. Um, this is a cool project. I just realized too that I'm wearing a photo lettering ink shirt today, so that was kind of fun. So uh, photo lettering was, um, Ed Bangat was the type director for it in like the 70s, and they made all the crazy stuff that is now being turned, like that you see everywhere. Um, um, the kind of like 70s and 80s and 60s influenced stuff. Like they, they, if you guys are familiar with old technologies at all, it was revolutionary, right? You went from metal type to being able to like, they, they would take pictures of it and be able to arrange it and then, you know, thank God we don't have to do that now, we're on computers. But, um, so House Industries bought the entire photo lettering collection, which is huge, and they bought it for $5,000 because no one wanted to do anything with it. It's so time consuming. Like it's, and most of, this, most of this old technology stuff with type, you can get for a song just because people just want someone to appreciate it. They want someone that is gonna actually like not just store it away or mistreat it or whatever. So they bought this whole collection and they're slowly trying to digitize a lot of the typefaces, but because a lot of them are so complicated, um, they set up this really fun site, uh, Photo Lettering Inc., in which you can actually set um, you know, a phrase that you want to, like, I love my cat. And it takes the individual fonts within a certain typeface and layers them for you. So Ben Keel is an awesome type designer, but also a crazy programmer. Most type designers are also insane programmer nerds. They all know like Python scripting and stuff, which is crazy. Um, but he built this whole website and, and it actually, photo lettering is awesome because the site is the typographer it's taking lettering and turning it into a font, so it's kind of everything in one. But, and then you buy the phrase that you want. They have a character limit, but it's pretty high, so you can buy really long phrases. And they send you a, uh, an outlined vector PDF for seven bucks. And it's cool because it's all this stuff that like, do you, do you really want this as a font? You're gonna use it for one project, and then that's gonna be it. So it's, and you get to uh, you know, redo the colors and stuff. It's very interactive, it's really cool. So display versus text type, most of you guys know the difference between this because you know that like the text type is the kind of workhorse stuff and the display type is the kind of zany stuff. But there's a big difference between like shitty display type and good display type. So that is like the, big, the biggest difference. And, and one, of the, one of the things that most people don't realize is how much time goes into making typefaces. So like this is obviously not much time has gone into making this. Very, very easy to see. But a lot of like the other display type, you don't quite realize how much like people that make the complicated scripts with like alternate characters and stuff, it's a big time investment. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things that I've realized, um, like I thought that I knew what I was talking about with lettering and type design, but graphic designers really don't understand what, what typeface design is like. Because if they did, they would not complain about how expensive fonts are. And this is like the biggest thing that I have realized. Like you guys complain, I'm not, not you guys, I'm talking about other people. Um, people like will look at an HNFJ font and say like, why would you ever pay $350 for this? Like blah, 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 it's a font. You know, and a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that think fonts should be free, not realizing that these are individuals that are like making a living doing this. They're not corporations. Um, so Gotham is everywhere. You guys are gonna all hand me your business cards later that have Gotham on it, and I know it. Because every time that I talk at a conference, everyone's like, yeah, Gotham's on my business card, and they hand me them, and I collect them now, I think. But, um, one of the, so Gotham is obviously like a huge typeface. It's super popular, everybody has it. But a lot of people don't realize how much goes into making a typeface like Gotham. So, um, like, this is all speculation, um, but, so Jonathan and Tobias, uh, Jonathan Heffler and Tobias are probably one of the few type designers that you guys probably know because they're out and about and talking about stuff all the time. Um, but they have a, a studio that's about 15 people. So, and Gotham took them like a year and a half or two years to make. So imagine paying the salaries of 15 people plus your own, plus the two founders of the company, plus probably about 10 grand a month in overhead for their Manhattan studio. In the end, like Gotham probably cost close, close to a million dollars to make. 
And you don't think about that when you think about a typeface or when you think about, uh, you know, even if you're talking about a display typeface that an individual typeface designer is making, they might spend, you know, eight months or nine months on it and they don't do anything but that for nine months. So imagine if nine months or a year you spent on something and then you had a bunch of people bitching about how they didn't want to pay for it and that it should be free, you know. And that's, that's the thing that most people don't realize is that even like the big, the big uh, studios like Font Bureau and all that stuff, it's still a, a handful of people. They're not big. Um, so when you think about typeface design, um, you should always kind of think about how much effort goes into it and, and complain slightly less about the cost of fonts. So everybody knows who Jonathan and Tobias are. And most people know what Verdana and Georgia is, right? But um, it's shocking how few people know who designed Verdana and Georgia, um, which is, of course, Matthew Carter, who is like a legend in the type world. Like, so if you guys don't know his name, he is like the guy. He like won the MacArthur Genius Grant this year. But, um, and this is something that I think is in part the fault of the type industry because forever, and this is part of graphic design too, we were all building these facades that said, I'm a legit business, I have a legal team, I'm a corporation, just because they thought that was the best way to like make people take them seriously. But in the end, it becomes like you become faceless and people don't mind stealing from you because they just don't believe that you're a person. And like the, the typefaces that Matthew Carter makes, he doesn't have like a, a team full of assistants the dude is you know has been doing it for years and years and he's still drawing everything like he it's him you know so all these typefaces that are coming out of his studio it's like him in a collaboration with another person or with two other people so and it's difficult to think about so if you guys ever win an award and you're the font that you used is like this big on a poster like if you write that type designer and be like that font was awesome I used it on this poster and won an award they would be like your friend forever because they are for sure like the unsung heroes of design. Like no one even thinks about it. It's the same way like when I was in high school and I didn't think about graphic design as an industry. It's like, it's like uh, another example would be like when you're trying to get a kid to eat white asparagus. Like white asparagus is like freaking scary to a kid because they're like, it's not green asparagus. I'm already afraid of regular asparagus. But like if you didn't know that white asparagus ex existed, you wouldn't like think to seek it. And a lot of people don't think about type design. They just think it's like an asset that they use and that these fonts are around forever and they're generated by Adobe. You know, it's, they're drawn by people and sold by people. So good to think about. So I, I learned a lot more about typeface design because I attended the Type at Cooper program, um, which is a continuing ed program in typeface design. I didn't last the entire program. I dropped out halfway through. And part of that is because I saw, like, I went into the program thinking that I knew what I was talking about and then learned, oh my god, I am not meant, I am not built for typeface design. So I, I was in it for six months and learned so much about the type world and about designing type. Um, but then once they got into the hardcore text type stuff, I'm like, I don't have the patience to deal with a project for more than six months, let alone for a year. So, um, but this was a revival typeface that I did in the first term when I was there, brioche. So, um, and I learned just kind of, there, this is again like it's you can't be a letterer or a type designer quickly. It's still master apprentice, you know. And as much as people try to make programs to teach it, it's it's not something that. And you guys experience this in design school too. It's like you're like, how come I didn't learn this in design school? It's because there's so much to learn. There's way too much to learn that you can't learn it in four years. Education is like a lifetime affair. It's not something that you can just decide like, oh, I'm just going to put in the time, get my degree, and then all of a sudden I'm just going to work forever and not like be continually educating myself. So the other thing that I learned is that type designers are completely crazy. So this is a font called Liza by this uh, design studio called Underwear, and they're uh, in the Netherlands. And there, it's another perfect example of like a group of people that are super nerdy and super great at designing at the same time. So they made this typeface, and they're the good kind of crazy. They made this typeface and they released like a 60 page PDF of how to use this typeface, right? Because there's so much random shit built in. So for one, there's like all these alternate characters, which, you know, if you, if you work in um, Illustrator or in design, you might be used to working with some alternate characters in the glyph palette. But they build in these crazy features, like, like it detects how long the word is and tries to estimate when the ink would have run out on your pen and then changes the character to be like, the ink ran out here. You know, and this is, they're just like nerds that do this and no one knows this and no one appreciates it and they don't care. Like if you ever try and talk to 
I, t I tried to set up a thing where I would like talk to typeface designers and get them on camera to be like, hey, I'm a person. And half of them were like, oh, I don't want to be on camera. People should appreciate me for my work, I'm not for me as a person, blah, blah, blah. They don't want any fame at all, but they don't realize that no one knows what they do. Because for one thing, everyone knows that people don't read the internet. You know, you go on the internet, you look at pretty pictures, and you stop. And, and the same thing with this, like how, how often have you read a PDF that came along with a font? Like never. And th but now I'm going to explain things to you. So th this, is, this is the example of like an amazing display font, right? This might be a limited use, but there are 1,400 glyphs in this typeface. And so most of like the crazy, and you, if you've ever opened, um, if you've ever opened the glyphs palette, you can see how many, how many things there are. And so most, most typefaces that are, you know, worth buying are going to have like somewhere between 400 and 500 glyphs. Um, just because you need all the alternate, you need all the uh, um, accent characters, you need lots of punctuation, um, you know, upper and lower, it doesn't stop at upper and lower. Um, but the display type that does this is really crazy. Alejandro Paul is another guy that does crazy display type. Most of his typefaces have over a thousand characters. And like this, this typeface has seven alternate U's, for example. And that's like not something that you think about and they probably could have stopped at one point. but. But they just want to make it like as, like whenever you make a typeface, you want to make it as useful and handy and get designers pumped about it as possible. So it's a shame that more, ty more designers don't understand the features that are built into a lot of these crazy typefaces. And then so web fonts are really awesome. And they're the, I, I gave a talk to Blurge this, this is going to talk to web designers a bit. And they're the reason why I think that a lot of the future of type is actually in web. Um, and that's not because like we all have to move to web, blah, blah, blah. It's because most print designers do not appreciate how much stuff they have to work with, right? You're like, oh my god, just another font. Ugh, I have this on my computer. But the, ty the web designers went years until, until like this year, essentially, only being able to use the same 10 typefaces. Imagine if like you went, like you guys I'm sure bitched in your one class in college where you had a professor that was like, we're going to do a project and you can only use these two typefaces. And everyone's like, what does that even mean? You know, <laughs> imagine doing that as a profession forever. So they're so stoked about type. Like I've never seen a group more happy and willing to embrace type. And they also understand that so much of what people see is, or so much of what goes into work is what happens behind the scenes. Because most, most really good web designers, they don't stop at like the aesthetic. They, they really follow through and make sure that the back end is as simple and organized and everything as possible. Like people will build whole websites, then go back and like change everything to make it cleaner and simpler. Even though it doesn't actually speed up the website all that much, they just like need it to be that way. And typeface designers are really similar in that respect. They want it to be perfect. They want everything to work. They are architects. They can't just like decide, oh, I'll just use plywood to build this building because no one will know the difference. You know, they, they look at it from the ground up. And I think that that's why a lot of the future in type is, is in web. So imagine if like you had nothing and then you could start from, from zero and work your, you know, your font library up you know, you're, you're going to curate it. And so a lot of people that are making fonts for the web now are really trying to make stuff that is well designed, you know, doesn't have shitty kerning or that the whole thing isn't done in kerning because spacing and kerning are two different things. You guys also don't know that. No one knows that. And, uh, you know, so it's really nice to see a, a whole new technology and, and group of people embracing type because I think that it's going to play a big part in the renaissance of, of typeface design and people appreciating typeface designers. So um, I'll end with, I, I talked earlier about advocating for, for specializers so that specialization is a great thing. So type designers and letters are of course like super specialized people within an already specialized world. And if we don't appreciate the things that we do for a living, like if, if you don't appreciate the things that someone else does and thinks that you can do them, that's how we end up with a bunch of like mediocre design or a bunch of people that are frustrated because they can't get the work that they want. So the more that you could do to kind of let other people's professions exist as they are and encourage it and develop it and delegate to it, the better it'll be for everybody and the more it'll generate more jobs. Because the, you know, the more you can delegate and, and specialize, the less people will rely on just one person to do an entire campaign. So that's it. So 
we have some time for questions. How long did I talk for, just so I know? Oh. Okay, an hour and 15 is much more dealable. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, an extra half hour. We got a dude here. Um, I know you said that it's obviously like a huge uh, whole other kind of deal, but what if there's like one resource or a couple resources you could you could suggest for learning about the history of type? So I think that's probably where I struggle the most is like movements and periods and all that kind of stuff where you can build the components. What might that be? Everybody that is interested in type has read Robert Brinkhurst's book, The Elements of Typographic Style, so that's required reading. Um, the Type Directors Club actually has a really good book list put together that Charles Nix put together. So if you go to tdc.org and click on resources, there's a whole page of blogs that specialize in type, plus a, a book list of all uh, different books that are available. And I don't think it's been updated in a little while, so there's probably other things available. There's, there's a, a book that came out called Just My Type recently, which um, I haven't read yet, but it looks really promising. And um, there's been a, there's been a few a few other books. I think one might be called Making Faces or something like that. Um, and so there's a, like it's kind of a there is definitely a renaissance in type design now. And in terms of learning the history, there's probably if anybody loves to talk history, it's type guys. So just corner one and make them talk to you for three hours. Like honestly, like and and that's the thing is like they're so enthusiastic, and but just have it's the same thing like. There's so many people that have just been beaten down and not appreciated. So whenever they see anyone with a spark of interest, like they just want to pour everything that they have into you. So um, you know, talk to like TDC isn't allowed to set up cha uh, charter uh, chapters, um, but they are allowed to have events other places. So if you want a type centric event, talk to them and bring people in. I'm sure that the AGA um, would be more than happy to talk to TDC for recommendations of people to bring out here and stuff like that. So another thing that, uh, so I set up Inker Linker for printers, but it was also kind of like to beta test an idea that I have for something else, which would be uh, an online site to find lecturers on really specific topics. So, and it would be, because the biggest thing is most universities can't, you know, can't afford to bring in people all the time. And you want to bring in people that are local, but at the same time, none of the students appreciate local people because they're like, I want this superstar, blah, 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 you know. Um, but I think that there would be a massive, massive benefit to having a type designer even just to come in for 15 minutes to a class in the sophomore year and be like, we exist, and then walk away, you know, like, <laughs> you know, because, like, that's the whole thing. If someone plants the seed and makes you understand, like, that something is out there, it makes you want to investigate it more. So that's what I kind of hope to do with the structure that I used for Anchor Linker is to make a, a lecture collective kind of site for free lecturers and universities. Yeah. Thank you, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, just a quick question about your last comment about the uh, web fonts. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to know from your experience, where do you see web fonts going? Um, I've been doing web for about 15 years. And it wasn't until six months ago that I really started using it because of bears of legal issues, technical yeah. issues. Like a lot of the, from my experience, um, you know, the kerning, you can't do it with CSS very well like you can with print. So can you give, a look, g give us your insight and where you think uh, web fonts are going? Well, the browsers, it's, it's all so new. Like it's so new. And actually browsers are doing a pretty good job at trying to keep up with what's out there and trying to adapt. So. Um, there's certain, like, Firefox is actually really forward-thinking in terms of the web font stuff. Like, I think kerning is actually available in a couple of browsers. Like, you can't kern it yourself, but the kerning of the font is available. So the, the biggest thing is, is choosing typefaces that are well-designed because you shouldn't have to kern something that is well-designed. So, um, and right now, I think the biggest issue with web fonts is that there's different, there's different models that work for different people. So, and, um, you know, different quality of typefaces available. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say don't use 
Google fonts. They're free, but because of that, you, you get what you pay for. There's a couple of good ones out there, but at the same time, I do think that Google has taken advantage of typeface designers um, with their model. So essentially, they pay people a flat, a flat free fee, and I'm assuming it's not big, um, since one of their people tried to recruit me to use one of my typefaces on Google fonts, and they offered me something that they thought was big and that I thought was laughable. And, uh, and it's just a flat fee, and you'll get any royalties from it. So the biggest thing is trying to figure out a structure that benefits um, people um, that want to use the typefaces, but at the same time doesn't completely screw over the typeface designers. The ones that I found to be the most useful and, and easy, Typekit is kind of ridiculous of what you get for your money. Like you pay a subscription fee, and even if you pay the top fee, you have essentially unlimited use of unlimited fonts of whatever they have on unlimited websites. It's ridiculous. It's like $100 a year. So, um, and the thing that I kind of really love about web fonts and, and why I hope that there's more kind of uh, desktop tools developed for web font users is that imagine the ability to access a library of typefaces and try it in your design without having to purchase it. And that's kind of what web fonts are. I feel like if you're a print designer and you want to be able to like try out a bunch of typefaces, learn a tiny bit of like web savvy stuff because you can essentially like sign up for these services and try out a bunch of typefaces and then buy the desktop version that you need. Um, Typekit's good, though they do specialize kind of more on the display end and less on the workhorse end. Um, WebType is the best one if you want um, workhorse text type. They're made by uh, Font Bureau and that is like the biggest posse of severe nerds ever. Like they focus on crazy stuff. So all of their, they, they recommend typefaces. They don't have a big library like how Typekit does. Typekit has a pretty big library. Um, but they do, they are very, very conscious of what their typefaces look, on, look at, even the like base environment, like IE5 on a shitty PC. Like they try and make typefaces that work on that well. If you guys didn't know this too, um, there's different text renderers on different computers and Mac is easy because it just smooths everything out. Um, but PCs, they, they don't smooth everything out, and because of that, everything looks a bit choppier. So typefaces have to be well hinted uh, for them to look good on PCs. So web type actually hints all their fonts. And so hinting involves like telling, you essentially code in what pixels should show up and what shouldn't. And like there, it's essentially just a bunch of like dudes in Russia that do this because it's so specialized. And you can pay upwards of $5 a glyph or something for them to do it. So imagine a 1400 character typeface that is then like, you're paying somewhere between two and five dollars a glyph for them to hint. So you're already, that's a huge loss for like a web font that someone's gonna bitch about paying ten dollars for. So, um, so yeah, and so web, web type doesn't do a, a yearly subscription, they do it as per typeface. Um, HNFJ is doing web fonts soon, they just started a beta. So anyone that went to the AJ Pivot con uh, conference had the opportunity of maybe getting a beta key. Um, and they wanted to figure out their own model because they didn't think that the other models out there were working and paying well enough, and which is probably true. So um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that's the, the reason why I think that the web fonts thing is so great is that the, the technologies that go into making typefaces and that go into making web are not dissimilar. And the web people really appreciate what goes into making a typeface and the type people appreciate all the finesse stuff that goes to like make, wanting something to be perfect. Like they do not, if, if a counter isn't showing up on some Windows thing, they will work until it does, you know? And I think that that's the difference. So if you, if you go with a cheapy service, you're gonna end up with a bunch of cheapy typefaces that aren't, that you have to hand kern. And um, an option that you might wanna consider for headlines and stuff is a dude wrote a script called lettering.js and it's a JavaScript plugin that you could use to do some funky lettering stuff um, with web fonts. So, yeah. Anybody else? Hi, Jessica. Hello. Thanks for coming. That was great. You're welcome. Our little cow town appreciates it. Um, I think you have something on your wall that's a phrase that says something, just give me a fucking chance. Yeah. What's that about? That is artwork that I saw at a gallery show. <laughs> so I, I went to this, I actually met the artist when I lived in Philadelphia. His name's Alex DeCourt. 
Um, it's uh, D-A-C-O-R-T-E. He doesn't actually do that much lettering stuff. This was just a random thing that he does. He, he does a lot of weird, like, homoerotic picture taking. <laughs> and, uh, but I went to this show and I saw it and it's, it's made out of, um, like, plexiglass that then has paint and, um, what's it, the, like, plasticky stuff that solidifies on top of it and, like, glitter. And so it says, just give me a fucking chance. And it looks like it's been spray painted onto the wall, but it's actually like mounted pieces of, of plastic. And I saw it at a gallery show and it was like four grand. And I was like, oh my God, that's way too expensive. And then I thought about it for like a full year. Like ev I would just think about it all the time. I had a picture, it was my background on my phone, you know? And that's when you know you lo really love something. That's why like, so Russ has my picture on his phone and I have like my cat's picture on mine. <laughs> But a year later, it was at some show in Austin, um, and he still hadn't sold it. And so I contacted him and was like, you know, I really want to buy that piece. I just can't stop thinking about it. I just have to do it. And I did. Yeah. Woo. But yeah, he should probably do more stuff like that, because that's been on, like all sorts of like interior designy crap and passed around the internet, because everybody loves curses. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? There we go. I just really like what you said about um, buying fonts. And a funny thing for me is when you actually buy a font, you start to it. appreciate it. And you're real precious about how you use it and where you use it and what client, you know, when you're. So um, anyway, I, I completely agree. So awesome. buy more fonts. Yeah. And also everyone should know that when you buy a font, you're not actually buying a font. You're, li you're buying a license to the font. And no one really reads the EULAs, but there's a lot of like, you guys probably won't get in trouble for too much stuff because you're not like Nike or something. But a lot of a lot of people build in stuff to their EULAs that says you can't use this in a logo. You can't use this as the over 75% of a design project. You know, and no one ever reads them because they just assume it's just all like legal mumbo jumbo. Um, but if you actually read that, you get to kind of understand what the you know type designer really intended for their typeface to be used for. And I think the biggest thing is like most people are intimidated to contact anyone. You know, most people aren't like me and tweeting about like being out bowling and stuff like that. Um, you know, type designers are pretty solitary. Most of them aren't super like computer nerds because they're, I mean, they're crazy computer nerds, but they're not Twitter people because they've got other stuff to do. Um, so, so you don't really think that you could just contact a typeface designer and they write you back. Like if you have a question, if, you, if there's a typeface that you want to use, or this is another thing that no one understands, if you want to use a typeface on a client project, but don't want to buy the typeface because it's like $700, if you email them, a lot of times they have a contract, an e a EULA set up or a contract that says you have the right to use it on one project, not to ever publish it, and you must delete it after a certain time frame. So you can actually get fonts to use for free for proposals as long as you build a trust relationship with Foundries. And, and that's the biggest thing, and, and they can't really automate that now. That's why you don't see a lot of like, Places like, oh, try before you buy, because it's, it's all an honor system. So, but if you can form a relationship with a type foundry, um, you know, if you contact Font Shop or something, like, there's probably a way for you to be able to be like, I really want to use this on a project, but the client hasn't okayed me to buy it yet. Can I pay you something in the interim time and I won't use it on anything? You know, they're, they're totally usually fine with that as long as they trust that you're not going to misuse, like, abuse the privilege of being able to do it. So, for sure, like, Email type designers, like when you win awards, when you want to use their typefaces, when you want to thank them for what they do, just like they're accessible and they're people and uh, most people don't know they're real. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, it's a combination of trying to name it after something it reminds me of, and then also something that looks really good when you write it in the font. So buttermilk, I was like, I really like that double T ligature. Let's figure something out for that. You know? <laughs> and uh, I think food, wine, and women usually works. So <laughs> if you look at most typefaces, they're probably named after food, wine, and women. <laughs> <laughs>